Hi, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Yu Ji Yang. I'm a second year undergraduate student majoring in business economics. And I'm the panel director of today's panel discussion on food and agriculture. It's titled, A New Era of Collaboration for the U.S.-China Agricultural Sector. There is a long history of U.S.-China collaboration in agriculture. Over the years, the relationship and dependency has grown broader and de deeper with tremendous benefits for both countries. As the world's largest producer and consumer of agricultural products, China continues to rapidly integrate best practices from abroad in areas such as agricultural innovation and food safety in order to meet the growing requirement of a large and increasingly wealthy population. Panelists will share their views on escalating demand and the trade volume between the two superpowers as food safety and growing, growing domestic demand becomes increasingly important for China. And they will share their ideas on what strategies are necessary to further enhance the much needed collaboration in this important sector. The distinguished speakers on this panel are Mr. Hua Liu, CEO and President of China Fisheries North America, Mr. Simon Shao, CEO of Green Pasture International, and CEO and Board Chair of Landwell LLC. Mr. Richard Wallach, Founder and Managing Principal of Fulton Capital Advisors. This panel will be moderated by Professor Jerry Nicholsberg. Professor Jerry Nicholsberg joined UCLA Anderson in 2006 and teaches economics in the MBA program with a focus on Asian economies. He's also a senior economist for the UCLA Anderson forecast where he plays a key role in the economic modeling and forecasting of the national <coughs> and California economies. Professor Nicholsberg has held executive positions with McDonnell Douglas, Flight Safety International, and Flight Safety <coughs> Boeing during a 15-year span in the aviation business. He also held position with the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, developing forecasting tools. He has advised the banks, investors, and financial institutions and is the author of two books on monetary econ economics and exchange rates. Let's please welcome our, our moderator and panelists for pa today's panel discussion on food and agriculture. Thanks. Thank you and uh, welcome. Uh, before we start, uh, I just want to uh, say thank you to our students who have organized this, this panel and uh, this conference. It's entirely student run and, and they do really a remarkable job. Uh, so it's my pleasure to uh, be the moderator for this panel. Uh, I've been uh, doing work one way or another uh, with China on cross-border transactions for 21 years, or advising cross-border transactions. And, and one of the things that is uh, kind of really striking, and you heard it in this morning's uh, comments by uh, William and Alan about uh, the, the future of China. China's changing and it's changing into a more of a consumer economy. And uh, consumers are demanding better food, more food, and food safety. So this is a particularly uh, timely panel. And I am really uh, pleased to welcome our uh, panelists. Uh, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with each one telling us a bit about uh, their experiences and um, so let's uh, begin with uh, Mr. Hua Lu. Uh, and uh, so we were talking last night about, so his business has been in fisheries, uh, grew up in Beijing, and uh, came to the US, studied in Seattle in the Pacific Northwest, where I did two years with uh, Boeing. Uh, decided it was too rainy there, I guess, which I did, and is now in Southern California. Uh, but as he was explaining last night, uh, fisheries is not going out with a case of Budweiser and some, uh, <laughs> some fishing line and catching fish. It's a big business, it's aquaculture, and, uh, and that's what supplies most of the fish. So uh, if you could tell us some of your experiences and, 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 and what your company does and how this relates to our, our topic of cross-border um, transactions in the uh, aquaculture business between China and the United States. 
<laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, um, I'm from uh, China Fisheries, North America. And um, talking about fisheries, um, man, many of you may not know the term fisheries. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I think the first uh, I want to explain a little bit ab about fisheries. Um, because uh, one day I, I got a phone call you know, to my uh, company's uh, landline and asking like, um, are you a aquarium? Uh, do you do you sell goldfish? Um, <laughs> I said no. Uh, we're a, f a fishing company. Uh, fishing company uh, means it's not uh, leisure fishing like uh, sport fishing. You know, go out for one day, th uh, three days. You know, come back with a good fresh fish. We're um, commercial fishing. Um, actually. Um, our company uh, is headquartered in Beijing, China, and now is the largest fishing company in, Ch in China. Uh, we own 500 fishing boats, working all over the world. And in 1985, um, the first fishing fleet from China went out to Western Africa to start China's pelagic fishing. So this year is 30 years anniversary of the pelagic fishing of China. So um, the fishing, uh, we have fishing bases um, all over the world. Like the first is uh, Western Africa. And now we have a tuna fishing uh, project in Fiji Islands um, in South Pacific Ocean. And we have squid fishing boats working um, in South America, in Argentina and then Peru. Uh, so, and also, you know, the the latest news is we sent out the first fishing boat to Antarctica to catch a little shrimp called krill. So these are all the uh, updates of uh, and the basic information of our company. And the, the company in the uh, US, um, what we do is, first is we import the seafood, the, the fish we caught from our boat directly. For example, um, the fresh tuna from Fiji Islands, we fly it within 10 hours from offloading to LAX, and we distribute it uh, to wholesalers, to restaurants, food service, uh, supermarket, within one or two days. So this is the freshest uh, seafood we bring in. And uh, second, uh, recently we <coughs> were getting in the seafood processing uh, business. Uh, what that means is, um, you know, a large amount of fish caught in the United States, for example, in Alaska. And those fish are exported to China, processed there, and re-imported back to the US. You, maybe you don't know, uh, the seafood consumption in the United States, 90% is imported from overseas. But those importation, um, a big percentage is they export it to China, processed, and uh, import it again. So this, um, we can see uh, how uh, these two economies, China and, and US, closely related. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our, our next distinguished uh, panelist is uh, Simon Shao. Uh, Simon has been uh, doing uh, business with China from Los Angeles for uh, at least 20 years. Uh, he founded Green Pasture International with college classmates to focus on quality forage uh, production and trade, including alfalfa, hay, and DDGS across the Pacific regions. Uh, and uh, recently, uh, they've acquired two properties in Utah, Escalante Ranch and uh, Pelican Farm. 
and is a pioneer in the new investment in agriculture. And that's something really in the agricultural sector in the US is quite new. There was kind of consolidation and disinvestment for a long time. Uh, so uh, that's exciting, but he is a man of many talents. Uh, and that includes uh, import and export manufacturing, uh, real estate, one of the largest toy importers in, uh, in uh, California, uh, and in 2013 acquired Landwill LLC uh, with current projects spanning uh, Southwest and, and East Asia and China. Uh, over the years, he's also uh, been a major philanthropic uh, contributor uh, to Los Angeles and to the local Chinese community. Uh, and he is widely acclaimed, previously served as governor of the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County, uh, and now serves as director of All China Federation of Returned Overseas and chairman of China America Educational Foundation, uh, continues to extend his influence to promote social welfare and intercultural understanding, and he has a degree in ecology from Shandong University. Uh, so, um, uh, among the many things that you do, <laughs> I already lost. <laughs> uh, if you could uh, talk about you know, your investments in the U.S. and, and, and uh, the business that you're engaged in as it relates to U.S. agriculture and, uh, and trade with China. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm so uh, pleasure to be here to have uh, some like kind of speech. Uh, my name is Simon. Uh, when we're talking about the, you know, when got to the United States, every time I got to the United States, I always say, what do you think about the United States? Everybody going to say, oh, I think about NASA, Los Angeles, talking about like IBM, talking about like uh, Wall Street, Armstrong, Bill Gates, mm -hmm. our Warren Buffett. Have you ever thought, actually, United States is the number one agriculture country in the world? And the number two is far behind. So what is the agriculture? It's very simple. Agriculture is far beyond the farms. Actually, broadly, agriculture can separate it into five kinds. Farmers, farming, what do you call it? Farming. The forestry, livestock, his job, fisheries, and his job. Winery or extra like uh, you know activities related to the agriculture. If narrowly with the agriculture, we're talking about the farming, still including a lot. The food crops, the forage crops, the economic crops, and green manure crops. So today we're just focused on the forage crops because the my business alfalfa is the the forage crops sector. So uh, because today we're talking about uh, the China and the US agriculture collaboration, so that's very interesting. We need to got some numbers first. China have arable land. We call them the irrig irrigated land. 300 million acres, 300 million acres. But China, that is 7% of the, I mean, 7% of the world arable land. But China have 1.2, 1.3 billion people. That is 21% of the world. And the U.S., let's come to the U.S. U.S. have 483 million acres of the arable land. And U.S., that is like 13% of the world arable land. But U.S. only have 300 million people. That is only 5% of the world. So it's no doubt U.S. is the biggest supplier and China is the biggest consumer. So this is how the relationship. Let's go to the second. China imported 140 million tons of the food crops on 2014. Export only 10 million tons of the food crops. This is the big, very big, how to say that? It's a deficit, huge deficit. But we come to the big picture. We can see China and US trade have a 
big surplus. How much is that? Do you know that? 340 billion US dollars. 340 billion US dollars. That's a big money. So uh, in China, we always say, you know, uh, on the 2014, China imported soybean over 70 million tons. You know how much is it? That's 35, actually 3.5 billion US dollars. And China, imp that's a 50%, that's all overseas. 50% is from the United States. That is 1.75 billion US dollars. That's a big number. But compare with the big numbers, only can buy five, the Boeing 745. That's the difference. You know, in the China, we are talking about like, uh, you know, the big deficit and big surplus. How to take care of it. I'm, I guess some numbers like in the, in the 2014 and, uh, and uh, the 2012. Okay, now go to the point is like, uh, who has the dominant power? So sometimes we're talking about dominant power in, in the politics. But when we're talking about the business, we always say the seller's market and the buyer's market. So between China and US, who has the dominant power? For example, in the 2012, China imported the corn. 98% is from the United States, 98%. But this 98% is like uh, 5 million tons of the corn. But actually, this is only 17% of the U.S., the whole year's production. 17%. It's very little. So that's why who has the dominant power, who has the pricing power, is very easy. So everybody now should have the answer, but, you know, but this answer is changing all the time. That is what we call the business opportunity. So uh, now come to my business, and just Jerry introduced me about my uh, farming business. And uh, my, me and my partner, actually, we are the pioneer for the first guy to export in the hay to China. And also, we are the first guy to buy the scaled farms in the United States to operating by ourselves pretty well. And uh, why this happened is pretty interesting. On the 2008, there's a two big things happen. The first one, I think all the guys from China know this. The sum of the, all the China's, the dairy industry almost being killed by somebody, some bad dairy farmers mixing the melamine into the milk pounders. That make the kids renal failure. This is the big, big issue. That's almost killed the China dairy industry. And the second one everybody here know is the US economy crisis. And these two things actually have nothing to do with each other, give us a big chance to jump in this business. You know why? Because China need the high protein hay, high quality hay for their dairy industry to improve their milk quality and gain the reputation back from the public in general. And in the US, all the farmers that are suffering, they like want to sell the hay quick and fast and cheap, want to cash out something to save their self life. That is why they even sell the hay with lower than the cost price. And we are right in the middle, right in the middle. So, and we catch the point and we got opportunity to do both. Buy the hay, export it to China, save the China dairy industry, and save the US farmers. This is why we, you know, we always say that chance always give the people to who have the, who prepared. We really prepared. We prepared this on the 2007, and we, you know, already starting how to export in the hay from the US to China. But we don't know 2008 have two this big issues happen. This is like happen on purpose to help us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's just kidding. So uh, when the demanding, when the China get a lot of hay, when the demanding going up and the price is going up, you know the silence market always like this. When the people demanding going up, in the, from the 2008, when we began to export in the hay to China, it's only like 5,000 tons in the whole year, and uh, on the 2011, already jumped up to like uh, 760,000 tons for the whole year. And the China have the potential 
three to five million tons of the hay. That is the potential. And when the price is going up, when the when the 2008 when selling the first first shipment of hay to China, only two hundred dollars per ton, CIF China. Going to 2011, it's already going to 450, just because the China buying the hay. China, the demand is so high. When the price going up, you know, that's just who make the most of the money. So can you believe it? You guess who make the most money. It's not a guy in the middle. It's not a user. It's not a, you know, like us in the, the trade, trading company. It's the farmers. I can tell you from beginning the hay from the field price $90 per short ton, raising up to $260. That's a $170 the pure profit come from there. And the farmers make the most of the money. And at that time, we make another smart decision. Very simple, be the farmers. <laughs> so in 2011, we buy our first ranch. The farm in the in the in the in the Utah. That's 3,250 3, acres, the first one. And in 2013, we bought the second one, Pelican Lake Farm. It's 1,250 acres. These two ranches already bring us like 20,000 tons of the high quality hay exporting to China every year, and they make us impressive profit. You know, this is uh, pretty interesting. At that time when we buy the ranch, the price is very good. And that's when the U.S., the real estate business is very bad. And we got a <clears throat> very good deal until right now. If I want to sell the ranch, it's already like uh, three or four times higher than before. That means like uh, I can retire right away. <laughs> but, but I really like this, the, this kind of job. Not only this, because you have a more potential to come from there. You know, everybody said California have a big drought the water problem. Actually, everywhere have the same problem. Our ranch is, called, is surrounded by a Green River. It's the, it's the water level is very low. And uh, we're just thinking of the water right worth much more money. We're thinking about a farm. We're thinking about a production. We're thinking about a trading business. Actually, in the US, the water right worth much more money. I just thinking about any day when the United States and the government tell me, hey, Simon, stop farming. We need your water right. My water right might worth like $100 million on that. It is true. So this is like a big number you don't know. So uh, we're just thinking about the, you know, the business between the China and the US for the agriculture. Actually, when you thinking about something, you always have the chance to do it. So I just encourage everybody, the business never stop. We will not stop thinking. So uh, even our business, or we still have some more on component, but I cannot release to you right now. So this is my business secret. So thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks. So you brought up, uh, Simon, an important issue that I want to come back to, which is food safety and food security. Uh, but uh, let's turn to our third distinguished uh, panelist, uh, Dick Wallach. Dick is involved in two disparate areas of real estate related businesses, uh, wine and vineyards. He founded Premier Pacific Vineyards in 1998 uh, and uh, was one of the largest developers and managers of high-end vineyards in the U.S. with 25 properties stretching from Santa Barbara all the way up into Oregon. And uh, if you've had fine California or Oregon wine, those grapes uh, may well have come from uh, one of the vineyards that uh, Dick and his partners have helped develop. Uh, he's been in the real estate investment business since 1971, uh, founding partner in two premium wine brands, Expression, uh, which is a Pinot Noir, and Tetra, which is a Bordeaux blend. Uh, he has a, an MBA from Stanford University uh, and graduated with distinction, an undergraduate degree from the University of Illinois, and has taught at both Stanford and uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, and is uh, an advisor to investors in, uh, in the wine business and in vineyards. Um, so we've talked about fish and we've talked about uh, forage crops and probably now it's time for good wine. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I, I want to, uh, one thing, if you learn nothing else today, uh, I want to make a distinction 
and this is something Alan uh, reminded me of, and I thought it's worth doing, because a lot of people get confused about terminology when you talk about wine and vineyards, etc. Wine and vineyards are not the same. So let's assume this was a bottle of wine. I wish it was, but it's not. Um, <laughs> and let's assume this is a bottle of wine. The brand, right, the label, Crystal Geyser in this case, Crystal Geyser Wines, delicious. Um, the, the, the brand is the wine, okay? The vineyard is the land. The brand and the land, they're not the same. There are, the brand is owned by a winery that makes the wine, makes the wine brand. The land can be owned by someone else, what we call a grower. Now some wineries own their land. Many do not. Many do not own any of their land. And they just buy grapes from growers, from landowners. Okay? Even at the very high end, many of them don't buy a lot of their land. You may be familiar with Silver Oak. That's a considered very high-end Cabernet from the Napa Valley. Half of their fruit is bought. They only own half of the, half of the land necessary to make their, their uh, wine. So that's the distinction. So when you say winery, that's the brand. Vineyard is the land, and understand that distinction. OK. Um, second thing I wanted to, uh, to say is that um, unlike uh, the two gentlemen you just heard on this panel, there is less cross-border activity, certainly in we don't export grapes to China. Okay, we export wine to China because China is becoming an increasing wine growing culture. Why? Well, it's kind of an old rule of thumb. Once you taste a bottle, of, a glass of wine, you never <laughs> stop drinking it and you tend not to drink less as you keep going on, you tend to drink more. And then as your economic uh, situation improves, which most people it happens to, they tend to buy more expensive wines. And China, uh, the United States took a long time to become a wine drinking culture, but we finally did towards the end of the, um, the 70s. We finally became a wine drinking culture. And I think China is becoming a wine drinking culture, but it's just beginning. It's just beginning. And the most of the imports that come from the United States into China, they're not the low-end wines, they're the high-end wines. We have to compete with France because the, the wealthy in China who started uh, drinking very expensive wines, they only knew about France at the time. The, the French made some strong inroads. And the high-end wines from uh, America are doing their best to try to uh, infiltrate, so to speak, the, the, uh, that, that uh, activity. And we're making progress, but it's going to take a, a, a lot of time. Um, the other thing that I wanted to um, mention is um, another distinction. Will I don't think there's a bottle of wine that's ever been imported from China into the United States to be purchased, okay? Uh, now, I could be wrong, but I, I, I think I'm close to right, okay? Uh, <laughs> and there's fundamental reasons for that. One is that um, wine, and not unlike other agricultural products that, that are grown, uh, wine, the quality is determined by two things. One is, the grapes, and two is the winemaker. Uh, there's an expression that I learned many years ago that I love, is the winemaker can only ruin great grapes. Okay, so you need a great winemaker, but you have to start with great grapes to make a great bottle of wine. Um, now, if you look at where the, the great wines have been made in the world so far, they're made, interestingly, on, well, let me tell you, France, California, Napa and Sonoma, for example. Um, Chile is making some very good wines. Is, what's common among those three areas? They're on the western banks of continents. 
and they get the oceanic influence, the cool oceanic influence in the in the evenings. I mean, you can. I have a home in Napa, in St. Helena in the Napa Valley. It can be in the summer. It can be 40 degrees when you wake up and 90 degrees by five o'clock. That kind of distinction, because you get the cool oceanic influence, the fog, etc. And that's very important when you're making a good bottle of wine, because the grapes, the grapes, have uh, characteristics that the Grape sugars, called BRICS, B -R -I -X, increase with the amount of heat during the growing season. It's called degree days, the number of degree days uh, during the growing season. And when the sugars get to a certain point, you have to pick the grapes, otherwise they'll turn and they'll actually <laughs> turn to alcohol. Um, but uh, you, you have to pick the grapes. Um, but the other characteristics that makes great wine, the tannins and the acids and th that create the character, they need a long period of time to develop. So if you're in a hot area and you don't get that oceanic influence, if you're on the eastern banks of continents, you can make decent wine. You can get a good winemaker and techniques for making wine have improved dramatically. But um, what happens is you don't get that um, that long growing season, which you would get like in Napa. Um, so the grapes have to be picked early before the, the grapes have been really come to maturity from their tannins and their acids um, aren't, don't mellow out. And so you get wines that just don't seem balanced and don't have great quality. Um, so that is the reason that France and the Western United States have done so well. And that's why we will continue to import in, tending at the higher end, the medium to higher end wine prices from the United States into China because China will grow a lot of wine and they're doing it now and there'll be many, much more because of the wine drinking culture. But for the expensive wines, the really good wines, um, it'll come from France, although France can't grow anymore and we're, get, we're getting constrained in the United States as well. Um, and from the United States and from selected areas like uh, New Zealand or, or um, Chile, et cetera. And uh, I think I'll end it there and um, let you ask your questions. <clears throat> Thank you, Dick. Uh, and, and you're so right about confusion on terminology. My first evening in Shenyang, uh, I was handed a uh, drink and I asked, uh, it, uh, what is this? And I was told, it's wine. And it was a uh, Baijiu called Mao Tai. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't taste like any California wine. Uh, so, um, China wine. W you know, when we're talking about food uh, uh, and, and, and food safety and food security, which is really a key issue today, particularly uh, in China, and, and we're talking about U.S. production being exported to China. So the U.S. has got a whole regulatory system set up to protect consumers of U.S. produced foods in the U.S. And China has its own system, and they're very, they're very different. So how do you navigate uh, these two different systems and protect yourself from things like what happened in the milk crisis? Where you know how do you con how do you control the quality all along so you protect your business? as well as navigate these uh, regulatory, uh, the, the regulatory uh, landscape? Uh, actually, uh, after 2008, China have the melamine problem. So China put a lot of attention on the, on the, the food safety. I just joking with somebody, now in the China, the milk is the most safe, safest time in the, in the whole, you know, whole world, what I can say. So for us, when we control the quality from the United States, so we always, you know, deal with like a pretty good reputation customer, a like supplier, you know, that we provided with the hay, that's the food for the dairy. When the dairy use the good food and they can get the quality milk. And how you control the quality, you know, because the, in, the, in the agriculture products always have some problem with the temperature, with the human, with the mother nature. So sometimes you cannot handle. So that's why when we buy the hay, we have to be very careful when we buy the alfalfa, because you have to put in a container shipped to China for 20 days, they might get mold. 
they might get some like a kind of the VW virus or something. That's why we have to be very careful to choose the supplier. And also in the China, both of them, in the China CIQ check the quality very, very toughly. Especially right now, they have the GMO issue, the, the gen, genetic modification organism. This is the one of the issue China very concerned. So I think between China and the US, the both sides be careful with their quality control. I think you know we are in the middle. We'll be pretty like a confidence with the the food safety issue. I don't know if I get a point. And, and, mm. uh, well, when it comes to uh, processing and shipping fishes. Um, is it different? I mean, uh, you have a whole host of regulations because it's um, it's animal products as opposed to uh, forage foods. Um, like I explained before, uh, two of our major business, one is um, we catch fish and ship it directly from the boat uh, to the market. And the second is um, we buy the fish processed in China's you know, plants and uh, re-export it. So both of the two business requires very strict food safety requirement. Um, to import any f seafood into the United States, we have to follow, it's called HACCP plan. And it's a, it's a plan um, controls each point from the catching on the on the boat and processing on the boat and uh, transportation processing and everything and the key point is temperature control uh, because uh, if the temperature is high uh, the fish the seafood can generate um, the tox uh, toxin called uh, histamine so we have to follow this this uh, HACCP plan very strictly uh, so and it's the same thing uh, for the processing business. And when we sh uh, ship it back, uh, the seafood in China and all the plants follow very strict rules. One is HACCP, and there is also European standard. And I'll say most of the plants, processing plants in China, uh, like in Dalian or Qingdao, their control is very very good. Um, so I think only the some some smaller plants, and they want to uh, keep their costs low, lower, and uh, offer better price. Like um, so, they they ignore some of the uh, regulations. Those are need to be closely supervised. So, so, so it sounds like from uh, both of you, what you're saying is choose your partners very carefully. And, uh, and, and and then you get the quality control. Um, and, and Dick, I was you know thinking about the uh, exportation of wine to uh, to China, and uh, so clearly California's got a comparative advantage there for all of the reasons that you said. Um, but wondering if the real opportunity isn't in buying it and shipping it and marketing it as opposed to investing in vineyards, but you. Uh, have some clients who are interested in investing in vineyards, so maybe you can enlighten us on the sort of the advantages of those well, uh, two the, parts of the food chain. The with the growing demand and the limited uh, uh, the 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 high quality wines in America are limited uh, to certain areas that get that right climate uh, and the right soils. You do need good soils too. Uh, you need. Um, rocky, more granular uh, soils rather than rich, loamy soils, um, because you, you want to you want the vine to strain um, during the growing season because it makes the the grapes kind of you know work harder. The, the vine works harder, and the grapes get more intense flavor. Um, and so um, the the land that will make that quality of wine the climates and soils is limited to certain areas and like for the Napa Valley is virtually planted out. I mean there uh, in I remember a number 2012 2012 there were increase of 54 acres <laughs> in the Napa Valley on top of 45,000 
okay? There, there's just no land being developed because it's the, the best land is gone already. Sonoma's getting there as well and part, uh, other parts. So, it's, so from a real estate standpoint, if you can own something that has growing demand where people are gonna pay you more and more for those grapes per ton, then you're, you've got a great real estate investment. It's one of the reasons I got into the vineyard business, out of the real estate business, is it's real estate, okay? Yes, it's growing, but it's real estate. Uh, <coughs> my income's going up, and therefore people will pay me more when I want to sell the, sell the vineyard. Um, and so that's the, the basic economic opportunity from the real estate. Now, from selling and distributing the wine, yes, uh, the, that's, you can make a lot of opportunity if you're in the brand business. But again, they're not necessarily the same, you know. And it takes time and money to invest in the marketing and distribution. Um, it's it's a tough business at the start because you've got to you're competing with hundreds and thousands of brands to get your name known, etc. But once you get there, um, you do pretty well. So uh, I had <coughs> more questions. I'm sure you all have many questions, and I only have five minutes left, according to uh, our timekeeper. So. Uh, hopefully, we have excited uh, some of you in uh, going into the agricultural in agriculture sector. Uh, and so I'd like to ask uh, our panelists to weigh in on what advice would you give uh, our students who say, you know, that's really cool. I think I would like to make my career in agriculture. What opportunities and, and, and uh, you know, what should they be looking at? So that's for everyone, so whomever wants to jump in first. Simon is saying okay. Dick is going to go first. Yeah. You know, I went on the big panel, so uh, that's just for the innovation. Uh, it's like a capital uh, capital for the venture capital, right? Yeah, they said that 95% of the investment is failure. It's going to be, you know, it's gone. But for the agriculture, I can tell you 105% will give you something for sure. That's my, agriculture is the most stable business in the world, this is what I can say, after I join this business. Might be take longer, but it's, it's well, for sure. It's slowly, but you know, remember, agriculture, the food, the people need the food and everything. I don't, I don't need to figure out, talk about that. And just thinking about like, if you wanna do this business, you need to know more about this business. You need to know more about agriculture. Agriculture is not simply farming, it's a lot. Thanks. Yeah, I'll say, like you said, agriculture is very stable business, um, very traditional. But nowadays, um, we're in, the, in an era like, everybody thinks go organic and go green. So this is a, a huge opportunity for agriculture, modern agriculture. Uh, like our fish is like directly from the deep ocean. It's wild caught. So we think it's organic. So if <laughs> <laughs> okay. so if anybody any student want to into this business, so it's a it's a very good choice, I'll say. <laughs> uh, the wine business, um, it's interesting. If you want to get into the vineyard side, the land side of the business, um, that's a real estate play, and so people who are interested in that uh, from a, a business uh, career, that's interesting. Uh, but if you want to get in the making of the wine, you've got to transfer to UC Davis uh, and, <laughs> and take, your, take your course in viticulture there. Um, and uh, probably the, the nicest thing I can say about a career opportunity, it's, it's the people are great, the industry is wonderful, it's romantic, it really is, okay? And you're tasting a lot of wine. <laughs> um, but it, the opportunities, probably the most opportunities would be in sales and marketing, okay? Because that's the real, ch real challenge, real opportunity. Just in the United States, there are 8,000 brands. So figure out how to beat those, okay? We, um, you know, and, and there, there are people by the way, I forgot to mention that Yao Ming has got started a brand, and he's he gets his wine from Napa. In fact, I own uh, one of my personal vineyards, and I sold him the wine. And you went on the web website; it said the Wallach family vineyard was one of the the vineyards that gave him the wine. And he's importing it 
the bulk of it to China. And he's right now raising, I think, uh, $3 million on a crowd on crowdfunder to expand his business. Uh, it's interesting. So it's the marketing and distribution that's where the most of the career opportunities are. And uh, at, at the uh, last Asia Society dinner, uh, Yao Ming uh, donated a magnum of wine. It's this huge magnum of wine. But when he held it up, it looked like a small bottle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, un unfortunately, we are out of time. Uh, and I would really like to go on longer, but uh, my uh, students here have said no. <laughs> so uh, please join me in thanking our distinguished panel.